Well, good thing they waited because now we get to say good afternoon <laughs> as opposed to good morning. Um, so I'm Wendy Henry. Um, I have the uh, pleasure of leading our global digital assets and blockchain group for consulting. And with me, I have Jennifer. Jennifer is the Director of Financial Technology Policy at Meta, where she works on policy initiatives related to payments, blockchain, and the metaverse economy. She previously held senior positions at the U.S. Department of Treasury for nearly two decades, where she led counter-illicit finance policy and strategy and served in a number of leadership roles in the Financial Action Task Force. So, Jennifer, we've heard a lot today about blockchain and digital assets, both of which are foundational to this emerging concept of the metaverse. Can you share with us a little bit about what is the metaverse? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> we get it a lot. Um, the best way to think about it is that it's really the next generation of the internet. But it's an internet that's not on a screen. It's not flat. It's 3D. Um, it's a more immersive experience. So you really will have the feeling of presence that you're you know, in virtual reality sitting next to someone um, that, you're, that you're interacting with. Um, when we talk about it that way, though, a lot of people become concerned, well, is the idea of the metaverse is going to replace how we experience things in, in person now? But we believe it'll really enhance those experiences, and it will be another tool to help us connect with people. Um, the other thing to understand is that the metaverse is not really one product. It's not, you know, one of Meta's apps, for example. It is going to be like the internet in that it's a constellation of products and platforms and technologies. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, just really to think about it in more detail, um, you know, you'll have virtual reality, which could be a headset that you put on, like our Quest headsets, um, that allow you to experience a virtual room or a virtual concert. It could also be augmented reality, and that might look like a pair of glasses that you put on and, you know, digital images are projected in front of you. Or it could be a mix of all of those things. And so, you know, just to plug into that feeling of presence, um, you know, my experience with the metaverse uh, really so far has been mostly in workrooms, which is a, which is a program and an experience that Meta has produced that allows people to have meetings in, in virtual reality. And, you know, our team is distributed globally. And so, you know, after three years of the pandemic and having, you know, meetings on flat screens and interacting with colleagues you've never met on a flat screen, we've started to have our meetings in virtual reality and workrooms. That's awesome. It, it's, it's been great. Um, I have to say, you really do, between the quality of the images, the 3D, you know, we're sitting in a conference room, my boss has curated it with some art on the walls, it really, and you have the sound quality, you really do have the feeling of presence that you're sitting next to your colleagues. Um, you know, one of the first times we had a meeting in VR, I was able to sort of give my colleague in Singapore a high five. <laughs> so there's an aspect of fun to it. But I, I think just that feeling of presence is really, really incredible. That's awesome. Um, so this, this really isn't something that's just out there for gamers or, you know, just to interact um, on that kind of level. It's, it's got value to it, right? So tell us a little bit about the economic potential in the metaverse, and then a little bit about which industries um, might, might be first adopters. Yeah. We think the economic potential is significant. Um, as the introduction mentioned, the early estimates are that it could be worth, you know, more than three trillion over the next decade. Um, so we see the economic benefits sort of playing out on three levels. You know, first you'll have the firms that are building the hardware, the software, the technologies that you need for the metaverse. Um, you know, second you'll have creators, developers, businesses that are going to benefit from producing the products and services in the metaverse. Mm -hmm. um, you know, think about all of the people that make an, a living on the internet today in a way that they couldn't have 10 years ago. We believe that the metaverse is gonna open up those kinds of opportunities for even more people. Yeah, even my grandkids are doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, um, you know, we see the metaverse really driving job creation and driving innovation and, 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 and productivity. Employers are going to have the potential to give employees, you know, enhanced education, enhanced training, 
people are going to have even greater opportunity to work with people that they're not co-located with. So all of that is, it really adds up to enormous economic potential. You know, already we're having, it's very, very early, but already we see really compelling use cases. You know, BMW, for example, is already using a metaverse created by NVIDIA to bring engineers together in a virtual reality, in a 3D space, to design cars and to push manufacturing forward. You know, another really compelling use case um, is in the medical field. Last year, there was a very complicated case um, involving two twins that were conjoined twins that needed a very, you know, difficult surgery to separate them. Um, there were teams of surgeons on both sides of the Atlantic in London and in Brazil that trained and practiced that surgery in 3D in the metaverse for weeks to be able to carry it out in real life. So the surgery was successful um, after all of that training, and those two twins are now, you know, living separately. So really, there's just incredible potential here. Yeah, I think those are kind of the kind of use cases that people are not necessarily connecting when they talk about the metaverse, but they're so essential to the way we can learn and, and do things in a much better way. Mm -hmm. Awesome examples. So you recently released a paper um, on the metaverse's economic opportunities, and it advocates for something called same risk, same rules. Um, First, can you tell us a little bit about what same risk, same rules means? And then what should regulators be thinking about when they're thinking about this? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I think it's important to remember, again, it's very early. So a lot of this is going to be driven by how the metaverse evolves. But it's clear that we need a financial ecosystem in the metaverse that is safe, that's trusted, and that's interoperable to really drive those economic, economic benefits that we talked about. Um, payments is going to be really important. People need to have a way to be paid for the, the, thing, the digital goods and contents they're creating. Supporting digital goods that are interoperable and portable is also really important. People need to be able to take their digital goods and content in and out of worlds seamlessly. Um, right now, if you come into Horizon Worlds, which is an experience that Meta offers, you pay with fiat currency. You, know, you have a debit and a credit card that's linked to an account, and that's how you pay for things. But there are burgeoning use cases, you know, in the broader metaverse that really support the use of digital assets. Um, those may be digital assets that are linked to the blockchain, or it may be digital assets that are not linked to the blockchain. We really see the potential for both um, going forward. So when we talk about same risk, same rules, same risk, same regulation, um, what we would encourage regulators to do is really think about specific digital assets and what the specific purpose and use case is as we're determining how to regulate them. You know, a great example of this is NFTs. We recently tested NFTs on our platforms, and the type of NFT that we were testing was really were digital collectibles. Okay. This is really like digital art, um, and it's very much similar to um, the type of art, physical art that you would have in your own home. Um, those don't have a financial use case. That's not a financial instrument. Um, and so what we have advocated for was let's not regulate NFTs that are digital collectibles as a financial instrument. Um, let's look at the, the risk and make the appropriate determination on what regulation. And I think already we've seen that European regulators are reaching that conclusion as well. The other thing that we would encourage regulators to do is really think more broadly about public and private sector um, collaboration. You know, the metaverse is not going to be built by the large, you know, um, usual companies, the big companies. Right. It's going to be a mix of big companies, small companies, developers, creators, um, lots of different stakeholders. And so it's really important to go beyond the usual consultation and really bring in those different points of view. Yeah, I think that's going to be critical. Um, so Michael Bonder this morning spoke about the necessity for trust um, and how critical it is that companies really have that trust both internally and externally. How can society trust that the metaverse is being built responsibly? And how do you see Meta's role um, and the larger industry's role in government in, in getting us there? Mm -hmm. um, well, the metaverse is not being built by one company. You know, as I just said, um, it's big companies, but it's also small companies. There's creators, 
um, it's developers, it's you know, policymakers. So we really believe that for the metaverse to be successful, it needs to be open and inclusive. And the way you get there is by having diverse stakeholders involved in building it. Mm -hmm. um, but in order to make it the seamless and open experience that we all, we all want, we know we need standards. And so that includes standards that are for the foundational protocols that we need, but also standards for the interoperable digital content and goods. Um, and so to try to help us get there, last year we partnered with 35 organizations to set up the Metaverse Standards Forum. Um, that group has now grown to more than 1,800 organizations. Wow. Um, it is working on creating a metaverse that is open and inclusive in the way that we hope it will be. We're also working with more than 100 organizations through the World Economic Forum. Um, that, that effort is really intended to set out a framework for how to build a metaverse that is economically viable, that's safe, that's trusted, and that's interoperable. And so we believe this is really going to happen the way the internet has developed. You know, it's going to be piece by piece, standard by standard, and it's going to involve a lot of public sector initiatives, but also private sector initiatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that public-private um, partnership is going to be critical as mm -hmm. we go forward. But also the interoperability, and love to see that you're focusing in on the standards, because even at the blockchain level, right, uh, in the digital assets, standards are such essential components of making it scalable and sustainable. So, right. Thank you. So I just want to let everyone know that the fun is going to begin at <laughs> 3 p.m. Um, as we go to our coffee break at the 3 p.m. coffee break because Meta has some of the Quest headsets here. And after I try them, I'm going first. Yeah. <laughs> um, you all are welcome to stop by and try those as well. Um, Jennifer, thank you. This thank has you. been truly insightful in seeing you know, where the metaverse is coming and where it's going. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks.